Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast, celebrating pro and college football history. This episode, Super Bowl Three, with Baltimore Colts Director of Player Personnel, Upton Bell. This is part three of a three-part series about three games that changed the NFL with guest Upton Bell. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast. We have an excellent episode here today for you with some great ones coming up in the future with stories from 49ers Hall of Fame linebacker Dave Wilcox, legendary coach Dick Vermeil, and even some AFL legends like Lionel Taylor. So please connect with the Game Before the Money Facebook page and check out the GameBeforeTheMoney.com to stay updated. I'm Jackson Michael, author of The Game Before the Money, Voices of the Men Who Built the NFL. That is published by the University of Nebraska Press. And so is the book Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL and the Rise of America's Game, co-written by our guest today, Upton Bell. We're going to conclude this three-part series about three games that changed the NFL that Upton has been sharing some fabulous stories with us for. Part one was episode 40 of the Game Before the Money podcast and focused on the 1948 NFL championship game between the Eagles and Cardinals. That was the first ever televised NFL championship, and Upton attended that game with his father, NFL Commissioner Burt Bell. Part two of this series was episode 46 of the Game Before the Money podcast and focused on the 1958 NFL championship game, that famous game between the Giants and Colts that many call the greatest game ever played. Ten seasons after the 1958 NFL Championship game was Super Bowl III, played at the Orange Bowl in Miami between the New York Jets and Baltimore Colts. Upton attended that game as well, this time as a member of the Baltimore Colts front office. He was the director of player personnel. So he's going to give us some first-hand accounts that you can't get anywhere else. This is a guy who attended the game as part of the Baltimore Colts and actually made a lot of draft selections that helped build that team. As I stated before, he attended all three of the championship games we've covered in this series, and he shares with us why he thought it was important to document them together in a series called Three Games That Changed the NFL. All three of those games, 48, 58, 68, had their each different complete story, characters, stories behind the stories, all of them historic, all of them completely different. I would call it the holy trinity of the NFL. Super Bowl III is famous for a number of reasons. The American Football League champion New York Jets were heavy underdogs to the National Football League champion Baltimore Colts. Many predicted the Colts to win by 18 points or more. Jets quarterback Joe Namath told reporters that he guaranteed the Jets would win. That comment later etched itself in pro football folklore as the guarantee after the Jets defeated the Colts 16-7 at the Orange Bowl in Miami. That was the first Super Bowl won by an AFL team at a time when a lot of experts thought the newer AFL was inferior to the long-established NFL. Super Bowl III is often called the greatest upset in pro football history. In his book, Present at the Creation, Upton called it the worst loss in the history of losses. In the book, The Game Before the Money, Jets Hall of Fame receiver Don Maynard said that he and his teammates expected to win the game. To most people, however, the Jets' victory was a huge surprise, and it shocked writers and fans across the country. 
Some wondered how an NFL team could lose to an AFL team in a championship game. Others say that if the two teams played each other 20 times, the Colts would have won 19 of those times. The Colts came into Super Bowl III the year after Vince Lombardi's Green Bay Packers had won five championships in seven years, including three championships in a row. What's often lost to history is that the Colts were nipping at the Packers' heels for most of that time. In 1967, the year of the Packers' famous Ice Bowl victory, the Colts only lost one regular season game. But the NFL had realigned to four divisions before the 1967 season, and the Colts were shut out of the playoffs by their division rivals, the Los Angeles Rams. The Rams won the division on a tiebreaker, and the Colts watched the playoffs from the couch with an 11-1-2 record. The next year, 1968, the Colts again only lost one regular season game. Baltimore went 13-1 and earned a spot in Super Bowl III. The 1968 Baltimore Colts owned a high-scoring offense, averaging four touchdowns worth of points each game. They were only held under 20 points in one game that season. They scored 16 points in a victory over Green Bay. The Colts played that year with Earl Morrill at quarterback after Johnny Unitas suffered an elbow injury in a preseason game. Baltimore head coach Don Shula put Unitas into one game in October to test his arm, and let's just say he wasn't the Johnny U we all know that day. Shula put Unitas in hoping he'd rally the team in a close game against Cleveland, and he instead made matters worse. He threw three interceptions and completed only one pass in 11 attempts in the Colts' only loss of the season. Unitas didn't play for another six weeks and threw fewer than 20 passes the rest of 1968. In his absence, Earl Morrill led the NFL in touchdown passes. He played lights out and won the league's Most Valuable Player Award. On the other side of the ball, Baltimore's defense only gave up 10.3 points per game, one of the lowest totals in pro football history. If you remember how good the 2000 Baltimore Ravens defense was, both the Ravens and the 1968 Colts own the exact same 10.3 points per game given up on defense. The 1968 Colts won their two NFL playoff games by a total score of 58 to 14. So if you remember those 2000 Baltimore Ravens and picture them with an explosive offense, that kind of gives you an idea of how dominant the 1968 Baltimore Colts were. Meanwhile, the New York Jets' offensive and defensive statistics stood comparable to the 1966 Chiefs and 1967 Raiders, teams that were overwhelmed by the Packers in the first two Super Bowls. In fact, both Oakland and Kansas City owned higher offensive points per game and fewer defensive points per game totals than the Jets. Both the Chiefs and Raiders Super Bowl teams gained more yardage in the regular season, and the Raiders gave up fewer yards on defense than the Jets. The Packers team that routed the Raiders in Super Bowl II finished 9-4-1 during the regular season, and the 66 Packers, who beat the Chiefs, finished 12-2. In 1968, the Colts stood with a 13-1 regular season NFL record with more offensive points per game and fewer defensive points per game than both of Lombardi's teams that dominated their AFL rivals in the Super Bowl. So it's easy to see how a lot of people might see Super Bowl III as an easy win for Don Shula's Baltimore Colts over Weeb Eubanks' New York Jets. Statistically, 
the game didn't look much different than the previous two Super Bowls that the NFL's Packers won by a total of 44 points. Upton Bell was the Colts director of player personnel and he tells us about the festivities that Colts owner Carol Rosenblum set up in Miami before Super Bowl III. Upton also gives us a sense of what his work schedule was like at the time. When I was at all the bowl games and came down, I believe, from the uh, Senior Bowl, it was interesting because it was almost like a victory party <laughs> they brought with them. There's a guy by the name of Bunty Lawrence, who was a friend of Carol Rosenblum's, who was Bert Lancaster's best friend. Lancaster was there. The vice president-elect was there, Spiro T. Agnew. I mean, it was a very kind of party atmosphere. And Shula controlled it pretty well, but it was kind of a feeling everybody was coming down for a coronation. Rosenblum had already set up the party. Joe Kennedy came to the game with Teddy. I mean, all the trappings of, of it, all the celebrities around it, and all of the kind of Mardi Gras atmosphere, and I'm saying to myself, <laughs> I hope we know we have to play a football game. It was kind of that, and I kind of felt funny and, and said, you know, it's Weeb, you know, it's Namath. We better be careful. As I mentioned before, this episode is a three-part series with Upton about games that changed the NFL. We're about to learn one way that Super Bowl three changed the NFL. We've now gotten used to all kinds of celebrities hanging out at the Super Bowl, as well as all the hoopla around celebrity quarterbacks. Now, if you're a longtime football fan who really knows the game, you know that a lot of times the celebrities around the Super Bowl know very little, if anything, about football and are just there because of the event. Upton points out that in 1968, this wasn't the typical atmosphere surrounding a professional football championship game. Everywhere Namath went, whether it was at a swimming pool, making declarations about winning, guaranteeing. I mean, people were following Joe Namath around like he was Greta Garbo, Marilyn Monroe. That's the first time in a Super Bowl, if you look at the ones before that, the two that the Packers won, you know, it was about the Packers and Lombardi, but it's all football. This was showbiz. Broadway Joe is here. Sonny Werblin is here. Let the parties roll. It was more like a film festival than a football occasion. For the first time, this had all the elements, Rosenblum and the Kennedys. Remember, Rosenblum was Joe Kennedy's, probably one of his best friends and business partners. Teddy ended up coming. The father, for the first time, even though he had a stroke, came to the game. That was big news. Rosenblum brings him to the game. And then in the locker room before the game is is the vice president-elect, Spiro T. Agdo. Broadway Joe, I, all, all of this, it was, I said to myself, Hollywood has, has, has descended upon Miami. It was an event. The first two Super Bowls featured small-town Green Bay against medium-sized Kansas City and Oakland. Super Bowl III featured the big-time political community of the Baltimore-Washington, D.C. area against the star power of New York City. Upton said that sort of hoopla happened more organically than the huge marketing machine surrounding present-day Super Bowls. There's always star power there, but nothing like this. This was an uncontrollable kind of... I felt like I was walking in the middle of Broadway myself. The biggest announcement now is the halftime show, not the two teams. Then it was the two teams with no kind of rehearsed uh, big announcements that we have now out of the NFL. This was all natural. It was a natural clash. It wasn't set up that way. There was no announcement that the halftime will be up with people or anything like that or all the pregame of festivities and parties and post-game stuff. It existed, but there was none of that. The biggest thing was everybody wanted to get an invitation to Rosenblum's victory party at Golden Beach. <laughs> so Super Bowl three is really the first time you have a lot going on around the game that's got nothing to do with football. Then you have a heavy favorite and an underdog that's virtually dismissed by the media. 
The face of that underdog was Joe Namath, who fans either loved for his flamboyance or despised him for it. But Namath wasn't the only underdog in this fight. A lot of people bring up that Super Bowl III was a victory for the American Football League and forced the old establishment of the NFL to finally recognize that the AFL could play ball. You've probably heard that story before and probably heard it many times. The overlooked but perhaps most important underdog in Super Bowl III didn't play a down and never put on a helmet that day. He stood on the sidelines wearing a suit and an ill-fitting baseball cap that said Jets on it. His name was Weeb Eubank. He was head coach of the New York Jets. Eubank previously was head coach of the Baltimore Colts when they won back-to-back NFL championships in 1958 and 1959. Colts owner Carol Rosenblum fired him just a few years later after the 1962 season. Rosenblum's new head coach was a 33-year-old assistant from the Detroit Lions named Don Shula. The Jets, meanwhile, immediately hired Weeb Eubank. The key to me to the game was Weeb. Weeb knew us better than anybody. We could have gone down as one of the greatest teams of that era. Remember, we only lost one game, and the reason we lost it was earlier to Cleveland because Shula decided to put Unitas in to see if his arm got any better, and he threw, I think, two interceptions, and and we, we were beaten. If not, we would have come into that game unbeaten. Let's add a couple of things together. Episode 46 of the Game Before the Money podcast was part two in this series and focused on the 1958 NFL Championship. Upton told us about Weeb Eubank's inspiring pregame speech to his Colts players before that championship game against the New York Giants. He called some of the players out by name and reminded them how other teams cut them and didn't believe they could play football, and here was their chance to prove everybody wrong. Exactly 10 years later, Weeb Eubank found himself in the exact same position. Baltimore Colts owner Carol Rosenblum had told him his performance wasn't good enough. Told him he wasn't needed anymore. Now, Weeb Eubank is entering a championship game against that very team. Super Bowl III was his chance to shock the football world ruin the Colts' preordained victory party, and fulfill his own pregame speech from the 1958 season. This was his chance to prove Carol Rosenblum wrong. Now, to my knowledge, that backstory didn't get talked about much before the game. The media talked about how great the Colts were, and they were great. On paper, the Jets didn't look much different statistically than the Kansas City and Oakland teams that were demolished by an NFL giant. Games aren't played on paper, though. They're played on the field. Upton talks about some game film that he saw in the Jets in the time leading up to the game. The feeling was, looking at the film, I thought that they were better than they were being given credit for. And I thought, although it was different in the game, that the key was stopping Namath. They had a decent defense. Jerry Philbin and John Elliott were really good. Al Atkinson, who I drafted and decided to sign with the Jets, they had some really good players, but they weren't very big. By today's standards, I would say Philbin would be lucky enough to play as a safety. wasn't very big. Elliott may be a linebacker. I mean, think of the size in, in those days. But the one thing that I did see is, Name of that, George Sauer Jr. who later played for me in Charlotte, terrific receiver. He had Don Maynard, Hall of Fame receiver. He had two of the best backs in football and in uh, Boozer and Matt Snell, and a decent offensive line. I kind of said, we better be careful here when uh, Lou Michaels and some of the other people were saying, you know, this could be easy. Upton wasn't the only one in the Colts camp that decided that the New York Jets might be a tougher opponent than the odds makers advertised. In his book, Present at the Creation, 
Upton wrote that one Colts veteran said he thought that they could score 50 points on the Jets. Colts defensive back Bobby Boyd told him that they might have to since the Jets had very good receivers along with Joe Namath. It's highly unlikely that Baltimore's head coach Don Shula overlooked the Jets. And the same thing with his assistant coach Chuck Knoll. The Jets were a very good team. The Colts were a great team. That doesn't mean that the NFL was inherently better than the AFL, but in this case, the Colts were likely the best team in pro football that year. They put a 13-1 and season together with their second string quarterback, Earl Morrill, who won the NFL's Most Valuable Player Award while Johnny Unitas suffered from that elbow injury. Morrill bounced around the NFL with several teams before arriving in Baltimore in 1968. Two years before that, he split time with a guy named Gary Wood on the New York Giants as they slugged through a 1-12-1 season, by far the worst record in the NFL that year. Then he backed up Fran Tarkenton the next year, and Tarkenton pulled the team to a 500 mark. Morrill was a journeyman who spent most of his career as a backup, and he caught lightning in a bottle in 1968. So you might say he had a career year, and you might say he played over his head. And that's not just me saying that either. Colts receiver Jimmy Orr wondered the same thing. Upton fills us in. And Jimmy Orr predicted. He said in the bus coming to the game, he said, I hope this isn't the day that Earl wakes up. Which means, you know, he's been living a charmed life, and will he go back to, you know, a decent to mediocre quarterback? And he did. At the beginning of the game, it looked like all the odds makers were right, and that Morrill would lead the Colts to an easy victory. Morrill completed a pass to John Mackey that went for 19 yards on the Colts' very first play from scrimmage. The Colts were in Jets territory after their third play on offense. Baltimore soon had a first down on New York's 19-yard line, but that's where the drive stalled. Lou Michaels missed a field goal. The Jets' defense bent, but it didn't break. Late in the first quarter, the game was still scoreless, when the Jets took over at their own four-yard line after a punt. Namath tossed a pass to receiver George Sauer, who lost the ball, and the Colts recovered on the Jets' 13-yard line. If you're a longtime football fan, you likely know that underdogs often have to play a perfect game to take down the best teams. Here's a spot in the game where you might think, "Uh uh-oh, That's really going to cost the Jets. Here's where the whole game is going to fall apart for them. Instead, Morrill threw an interception on third and four from the six-yard line. Randy Beverly of the Jets intercepted the pass after it bounced off tight end Tom Mitchell's shoulder pads on a slant pattern near the goal line. Beverly picked it off in the end zone for a touchback. That happened on the second play of the second quarter. I watched that play several times, and it looks like Jets linebacker Al Atkinson, a man that Upton drafted for the Colts, but who signed with the AFL's Jets, he seemed to read that play. He drifted to his right, and it looks like he might have tipped the ball to alter it slightly. Either that, or his hands may have distracted Mitchell. Whatever the case, the pass bounced off his shoulder pad and floated into the arms of the New York Jets' Randy Beverly. So Super Bowl III was a situation where the Colts had an opportunity to be up at least 10 to nothing early in the second quarter. Instead, the game remained scoreless. The Jets owned the momentum and had the ball on their own 20. This is where you might first spot real signs of trouble for the Colts. If you know football, or even sports in general, you probably know that the longer the underdog can keep it close, the better their chances to win. And the more opportunities an overwhelming favorite fails to convert, the more confidence builds in the underdog, and the more they think, hey, we can really play with these guys. 
The Jets responded and ran running back Matt Snell four straight times. Then they called four straight pass plays. Namath completed three of those four passes to get to the Colts' 34-yard line, and the ball found its way into Matt Snell's hands on three of the four next plays, including a four-yard touchdown run to his left. Despite the fact that the Colts had run several plays inside Jets' territory, New York had a 7-0 lead with just over nine minutes left in the second quarter. Upton says that Matt Snell played a huge part in New York's win and explains how the Jets' offensive line contained Baltimore's Hall of Fame defensive end, Bubba Smith. When you study it closely, you'll see a couple of things. One, Namath, he was a threat. You had to be aware of him. He wasn't the person who won the game. The person that won the game was Matt Snell, who they kept running to our right side, their left side. And their offensive line opened up the holes just enough to get him through there. He had a hundred some yards on the ground. And what they would do is, for the first time, the way they uh, played against Bubba Smith was on every play they cut him. If you go back and look, they they go low on his legs because he's six foot seven. They didn't take him straight on. They moved him, and then they cut him. And uh, a Snell. You know, have a hell of a day. Matt Snell carried the ball 30 times for 121 yards and the Jets' only touchdown in Super Bowl III. He also had four receptions for 40 yards. That's a massive day. He only averaged 12 carries a game that year. He only ran the ball 20 times once during the regular season and he only caught 16 passes the whole year. Snell was an important part of the Jets' offense for much of his career. He gained 700 yards rushing in 1968, but on that day, he was the featured component of New York's attack. Receiver George Sauer also played a big role for the Jets, picking up 133 yards on eight receptions. Namath threw for over 3,100 yards in 14 games that season, with Sauer and Don Maynard both collecting over a thousand yards each. Maynard suffered a hamstring injury and served as an effective decoy on Super Bowl Sunday, and he didn't make a single catch after having a huge game against Oakland in the AFL Championship. The Jets led a balanced attack in Super Bowl III, gaining 142 yards on the ground and 206 through the air. An overlooked statistic is that the Colts actually ran for 143 yards in that game, and the difference in total yards was fewer than 15. So what made the difference in the game? Turnovers and special teams. Earl Morrill threw three interceptions, all in the second quarter. We talked about the first one earlier, the one that bounced off the tight ends, shoulder pads, and into the arms of Jets defensive back Randy Beverly. The second also came near the goal line as Morrill threw into traffic and former Colt Johnny Sample, a hero of the 1959 NFL Championship game, intercepted the ball at the Jets' two-yard line. Morrill's third interception is probably the most talked about play of that game. The Colts were on the Jets' 41 with about 25 seconds left in the first half. Baltimore called a flea flicker. Morrill flipped the ball to running back Tom Matty, who tossed it back to Morrill. If you get a chance to watch the play online, you'll hear NBC announcer Kurt Gowdy exclaim that Colts receiver Jimmy Orr is wide open, all by himself. On other highlight reels, you'll see Jimmy Orr frantically waving his arm to get Morrill's attention, as he's the only person in the camera angle on the left sideline. But Morrill never turned to look that way. He instead threw the ball over the middle to Jerry Hill, who might have been a step or two ahead of defensive back Jim Hudson. But Hudson closed in quickly, stepped in front of the pass, and picked it off on the final play of the first half. Had Morrill seen Orr and completed an easy pass to him, 
the Colts would have likely had an easy touchdown. The thing that started all off is we are running all through and then the famous play where Earl Barrow missed Jimmy Orwell in the end zone. If he sees him, he claims he lost it in the sea of shirts. I don't know. If he sees him, and that's the touchdown, the route is on. Upton tells us that the flea flicker play originally found its way into the Colts playbook when Weeb Eubank was their head coach. We always ran it in practice. They called it the flea flicker. Weeb loved it. And United had perfected it. We always looked for times when we didn't think people were looking for it. And it's interesting because we was the guy that originated with United. And yet still, at that particular moment, totally fooled the Jets, wide open. And I remember saying to myself, I was sitting in the coaching booth, I don't want to say it to the coach, I'm saying to myself, that could be the game. The flea flicker play ended the first half. The Jets still led 7 to nothing. Had Morrow completed the pass to Orr, it likely would have been 7-7. Seven to seven. The Colts would have celebrated going into the locker room. Instead, the Colts entered the locker room trailing by 7 and wondering what the heck was going on. On NBC's broadcast, Kirk Gowdy mentioned that it was the first time the Colts had been shut out in the first half all season. All told, it was the first time the Colts had a scoreless first half since midway through 1967. Leading up to Super Bowl III, the Colts had been shut out in the first half only one time in their last 33 games. For the Jets' defense, it had been the third time they shut out an offense in the first half that season. In seven other games, they gave up seven points or less. Get this, the 1968 New York Jets were ahead at halftime in all but two of their games. So for the Jets, a halftime lead was commonplace. For the Colts, trailing at halftime was new. So was making so many mistakes in the game. The Colts had been in Jets territory five times in the first half and came up empty, zero points, two missed field goals, and three interceptions narrated the reasons why. Jimmy Orr's fear that Earl Morrill might wake up from his dream MVP season to a lackluster Super Bowl performance manifested itself in Miami's Orange Bowl. But Earl Morrill wasn't the only MVP quarterback the Colts had on their roster. The great Johnny Unitas waited in the wings. The great controversy is that Shula told Unitas that's what Unitas claims that if it didn't go well, he would start him the second half. Now, people deny that. The Colts got the ball to start the second half. Morrill remained at quarterback. He handed off to Tom Matty, ran for eight yards, and fumbled. The Jets recovered on Baltimore's 33-yard line. The Jets then ran nearly four minutes off the clock and kicked a field goal. It was 10-0 New York. The Jets' defense then forced a three and out, ran another four minutes off the clock, and kicked another field goal to make it 13 to nothing. Four minutes remained in the third quarter, and then Shula brought in Johnny Unitas. We weren't prepared. Their game plan was to run it on us. Nobody had run it on us all year long. So that kept the score close. We were making all sorts of mistakes. And by the time the United got in the game, it was over. The Jets held the Colts to another three and out on United's first possession. New York started with good field position on their own 37 after a punt. Namath completed two consecutive passes to George Sauer, one of them a 39-yard gain that got New York to Baltimore's 10-yard line. The third quarter ended, and soon afterward, Jim Turner kicked a field goal for the Jets early in the fourth quarter, and the Jets led 16 to nothing. Ten years earlier, America watched as Johnny Unitas dug the Colts out of a hole in Yankee Stadium against the New York Giants in the 1958 NFL Championship game. 
the nation wondered if he could do it again against New York's AFL franchise in the Super Bowl. He completed a couple of passes as Colts running backs broke off big chunks of yardage. An overlooked piece of this game is that as great as the Jets ran the ball, Baltimore's Tom Matty rushed for well over 100 yards as the Colts found seams in New York's defense. We were running up and down the field on them. I mean, they couldn't stop. Even a guy like Matty, who wasn't particularly fast but was really a good runner, he was, I mean, there were gaping holes in their defense. Tom Maddy rushed for 116 yards in Super Bowl III. His regular season high that year was 87 yards. He was an eight-year veteran who had gone over 100 yards in a game only twice in his career before Super Bowl III. But still, the mistakes added up for the Colts. Unitas drove them to the Jets' 25-yard line and then threw an interception. The Jets' offense alternated handing off to Emerson Boozer and Matt Snell. And that's when they really went to the running game. You know, Namath never threw a pass in the fourth quarter. New York pulled to the Baltimore 35-yard line, but the drive ended with a missed field goal. Still, the Jets again erased four minutes off the game clock and had a 16-0 lead in a day when the Colts couldn't go for two points after a touchdown in the Super Bowl. That was basically a three-possession lead with about six and a half minutes left in the game. Plus, the rules of the day put the ball at the 20-yard line after a missed field goal attempt, so the Jets basically got 15 yards out of the failed attempt. Unitas threw three straight incompletions and Baltimore went for a 4th and 10 from their own 20-yard line. Johnny Yu completed a 17-yard pass to Jimmy Orr for a first down. Unitas drove the Colts all the way to a first down on the Jets' 2-yard line with about 4.5 minutes left, and it still took the Colts 3 plays to get those 2 yards, 4 plays if you count a play that went for no gain, but the Jets were offsides. Baltimore finally scored a one-yard touchdown on third down with only 3.32 left in the game. The score was 16-7 Jets. Baltimore's Lou Michaels attempted an onside kick and the Colts recovered. This was about the only real thing to go right for the Colts that day. Unitas made things exciting with a couple of completions to the New York 19-yard line. Three incompletions later, however, the Colts turned the ball over on downs with 2.44 left. The game was mostly academic at that point. New York ran the ball and wiped away the clock. They even took two delay of game penalties to delete a few extra seconds. Baltimore didn't get the ball back until there were only 10 seconds left in the game. The mighty Colts, perhaps one of the best teams in pro football history, fell to the New York Jets, champions of the American Football League that started from scratch less than a decade before. They literally shocked the football world in a game few writers and fans left them a chance to keep close, let alone win. Upton gives us his recap of the game from his perspective as the Colts' director of player personnel. The problem was overconfidence. Uh, I would say on nine out of ten days, we would beat them easily. They only scored one touchdown. If somebody scores 16 points, you ordinarily beat them. But I give Weeb credit, you know, in a brilliant game plan. And like everything else in life, you have to have some luck. But any one of those plays, the Mitchell play and the Jimmy Orr wide in the end zone, and the game is over. Let me say this. The Orr touchdown, the Mitchell, and at least one field goal, and it's 17 nothing. Then Namath is forced to throw all the time, and we have one of the best defensive backfields, Jerry Logan, Rick Volk, and we've got Lenny Lyles at the corners with Bobby Boyd. Let's put the New York Jets win over the Baltimore Colts into context through the lens of this series of three games that changed the NFL. 
1958 NFL Championship game and its historic finish was the first time pro football held America's attention for one afternoon. Super Bowl III took things to a whole new level. The story of the well-established NFL going up against the upstart AFL story has been told many times over, and you likely know that's part of the picture. The AFL proved itself that day. The underdog beat an overwhelming favorite in David versus Goliath fashion. What's often forgotten is that pro football had never brought that kind of story to America before. The only two comparisons that the New York Times could draw the next day in terms of how big an upset this was, was the story of Cassius Clay knocking out Sonny Liston in 1964 and a horse race that happened in 1919. Another article compared the Jets' victory to the famous 1948 presidential election that Harry Truman won over predicted winner Thomas Dewey and the Chicago Daily Tribune prematurely printed a Dewey Defeats Truman headline. Super Bowl III was also the first celebrity-driven Super Bowl, with Bob Hope and Apollo astronauts part of the pregame festivities. Broadway Joe Namath offhandedly guaranteed a win at a Miami Touchdown Club gathering, and he was a star football player who was also well-known for his playboy lifestyle. And then there was the Baltimore celebrity contingent with Carol Rosenblum's star-studded post-game party set up in advance. Obviously, it wasn't the victory party that Rosenblum had planned. You know, Roselle was going to come to the party and Tex Ram, and it's a beautiful setting. Teddy actually did come to the party afterwards, and Carol was moaning to him about this is the worst loss of his life and one of the terrible moments of life. But everything was set up for a Hollywood ending, and uh, welcome to the Oscars. Of course, the fairy tale ended at midnight. As bad as the loss was for the Colts, things could have been worse. Much worse. Colt defensive back Rick Volk likely suffered a concussion early in the game as he tackled Matt Snell head-on. Volk left the field after the play. He was back in the game when the Colts attempted an onside kick in the fourth quarter. Volk dove for the ball, took a hit to the head, and ended on the bottom of the pile. Four of his teammates carried his sagging body off the field. He looked limp as his teammates literally dragged him to the sidelines. What happened was on one of the kickoffs, he got kicked in the head. Well, not on purpose, he had been... Uh, unlike today, there's no tent to go into or anything else like that. You know, most of the people in those days, and that's why a lot of them end up with brain injuries, a lot of them got, they called it dinged, uh, would have a concussion. But then he played in the game, and uh, but he wasn't the same person. When we got back to the hotel, and uh, players were going up to the room and getting changed, they're going to have a bus and bring us out to Rosenblum's house. It was supposed to be a victory party, of course, as we know it wasn't. His wife screamed out, and Chuck Noll and one of the doctors came running down, and he was in convulsion. So they put him in a bathtub, ran cold water on him, and his wife was saved by, because he was then choking on his own tongue, one of the doctors uh, got a, a, a depressor and pulled his tongue out, or he had been dead. He tells the story. There was a segment on the NFL Network about three or four years ago where he tells the story. I knew the story. We not only lost the game, but we're lucky that he did die. Volk, an all-pro defensive back for the Colts, continued his NFL career and started Super Bowl V for Baltimore when they defeated the Dallas Cowboys. And that brings us to a good place to talk about the Baltimore Colts and their history of winning around that time. They were the first team to win the Super Bowl after the merger. Also noteworthy is that the 1968 Colts that dominated the NFL weren't the same team that won back-to-back championships in the late 50s and even differed greatly from the 1964 Colts that also had a dominant regular season before losing to the Cleveland Browns in the 1964 NFL championship game. Hall of Famers... Lenny Moore and Raymond Berry retired after the 1967 season. 
Hall of Famers Gino Marchetti, Art Donovan, and Jim Parker also had retired by then. The Colts restocked through the draft, picking up new stars such as John Mackey and Mike Curtis, and also through trades such as Shula trading a backup tight end for future league MVP Earl Morrill. The Colts stayed as one of the very top teams in the NFL for over a decade, even though they went through three head coaches during that time. And the great Johnny Unitas missed most of the Super Bowl season of 1968 and the Colts' Western Division playoff game in 1965. Upton talks about the Colts' success and how a playoff format like today's might have brought even more championship seasons. And remember, we broke up the Packers' streak. Packers won in 61 and 62. Then they lost to the Bears. The Bears won in 63 and beat the Giants. And we again beat the Packers in 64 and went to the championship game. And so, 64 and 68... But equally as good, it was the 67 team that came in. We lost to the Rams in that final day. If we, if we had beat the Rams, we would have gone 64, 65, 67, 68, and 70. They wouldn't be talking about Lombardi and the Packers. They'd be talking at Shula and the Colts. You could say the Colts had a good chance to become the team of the 60s if the ball had bounced their way. The team of the 1970s, of course, was the Pittsburgh Steelers, whose head coach Chuck Knoll was a defensive assistant on the Colts coaching staff in Super Bowl III. If you know much about Upton's father, Burt Bell, you know he once co-owned the Steelers and he was good friends with Steelers owner Art Rooney. Upton knew the Rooney family well and gave them some friendly advice. After we're walking down after the Super Bowl is over and it's embarrassing we lost to the Jets, I end up walking down from the press box with Dan Rooney. I've become very close to Chuck Noll. I'm in the book that Michael McCambridge wrote about Chuck Noll because I, I called him Newt Knowledge. He had an answer for everything, funny or not. And I told Dan Rooney as a book, they only scored 16 points. This guy is going to be the next great coach, in my opinion. You should talk to him. And two days later, he did talk to Chuck and then talked to Shula, and Chuck got the job. I called Mr. Rooney, too. I said, Mr. Rooney, they were going to talk to Nick Scorch, and he was, I said, Mr. Rooney, forget it. Chuck Noel could be your coach for 10 years, and the rest is history. Chuck Noel was hired by the Steelers before the month was up. Shula coached the Colts for one more season and was off to Miami for the 1970 season, the year the Colts won the Super Bowl under head coach Don McCafferty. Weeb Eubank stands as the only head coach in Baltimore Colts history to win back-to-back championships. In Super Bowl III, he got revenge on his former team for firing him. He also defeated his protege, Don Shula, who played defensive back for him on the Colts. Although Joe Namath got the headlines for the victory and other members of the Jets, such as Matt Snell and their offensive line, grabbed paragraph headings, Weeb Eubank played an enormous part in the Jets winning Super Bowl III. Special teams also played an often overlooked part in the Jets win. Jets kicker Jim Turner kicked 34 field goals in 1968. That set an all-time record for field goals for a single season in pro football. That record wasn't broken until, get ready for this name from the past, Aliaji Sheik broke it in 1983. When was the last time you thought of Aliaji Sheik? Anyway, Jim Turner's single-season record stood for about 15 years and well into the scheduled change from 14 games to 16 games. For you trivia fans out there, the current record after the 2020 season is 44 by David Akers in 2011. Baltimore's kicker in 1968, Lou Michaels, he was a defensive end for most of his career. 
He only made 18 field goals in all of 1968. The Jets won the game on field goals as Turner was 3 of 5 and Michaels was 0 for 2. Of course, there were a lot of other factors in the Jets' win, so I'm not blaming Lou Michaels for the loss. I am pointing out the special teams was an overlooked difference in this game. Both kickers missed two field goals, but Turner made three, and the Jets won by nine points. The Orange Bowl in Miami provided the stage for Super Bowl III. Four years before that, the stadium provided what was likely Jets quarterback Joe Namath's biggest football heartbreak. He was ruled down just short of the goal line in the fourth quarter of the 1965 Orange Bowl game, and the Texas Longhorns defeated Namath's Alabama Crimson Tide in a remarkable game that stings Alabama to this day. But that moment would not be the defining moment of Joe Namath in Miami's Orange Bowl. January 12th, 1969 would replace that distinction. That was the date that Super Bowl III was played on. Of course, Joe Namath's jersey number is 12, and the win made the AFL's record against the NFL 1-2 and two in Super Bowls. Some numbers that really add up are the increased revenue and the growth of pro football as both the AFL and NFL combined under the National Football League's banner. By 1972, the year that Don Shula would coach the Miami Dolphins to an undefeated season, pro football topped every other sport in a Gallup poll of Americans listing their favorite sport. That was only the beginning. The league that struggled to stay afloat during World War II found a tiny foothold in the snowy turf in Philadelphia in the first ever televised broadcast of an NFL championship game in 1948. Ten years later, NFL Commissioner Burt Bell's league firmly planted itself in the big time as 45 million Americans glued their eyes to the dramatic finish of the 1958 NFL championship game won by a magical quarterback named Johnny Unitas. Ten years later, a season-long injury left an aging Unitas on the bench for most of Super Bowl III, as the New York Jets' Joe Namath would be the youngest quarterback to win a Super Bowl in the 20th century. Episode 4 of the Game Before the Money podcast was entitled Burt Bell, the Great Commissioner. In that episode, Upton told us that it was his father who coined the phrase about how any pro football team could beat another on any given Sunday. This time, that given Sunday was Super Bowl Sunday, and millions watched a remarkable upset by the New York Jets in Super Bowl III. That Sunday proved Burt Bell's statement. The country sat down as a nation and watched perhaps the biggest upset in pro sports up to that time. And many still call it the biggest upset in pro sports history. And that was the first time that pro football provided that kind of narrative. Some might say that Bill Mazarowski's Homer to lift the Pirates over the Yankees in the 1960 World Series was a bigger upset. But in terms of one single game where everything's on the line, People knew that anything could happen when the Pirates and Yankees came down to that one game. Super Bowl Sunday always comes down to one game, and Super Bowl III showcased how pro football could attract glamorous attention outside the lines, and that the game is never over before it starts. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Game Before the Money podcast. Part 3 in a three-part series on games that changed the NFL with Upton Bell. Upton shares even more stories about Super Bowl 3 in his book, Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL, and the Rise of America's Game, published by the University of Nebraska Press. Again, I'd like to thank Upton for all the great stories that he shares with this podcast. Upcoming episodes of the Game Before the Money podcast include stories from Hall of Fame linebacker Dave Wilcox and Dick Vermeil, 
So please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And you can also listen at thegamebeforethemoney.com. Transcriptions of podcasts can be found on thegamebeforethemoney.com and are powered by our transcription partner, Sonics. S-O-N-I-X. Visit sonics.ai to learn more about their transcription services. 